today we are talking about why I am afraid of Americans. What? I simply cannot let this go. Hmm. So I did a video on, was it just Monday? <laughs> I did a video on Monday about, is there still time left to stockpile? And in that video, I was talking about how, you know, there's a lot of crazy and chaos going on. And Sarah's like, Sarah's wondering, do we think the economy will crash? Well, first of all, we know the economy is definitely going to crash sometime. In the book of Revelation, chapter six, it talks about how it's going to cost a day's, a day's wages to buy a loaf of bread for the whole world. So we know it's going to crash sometime. Now, whether it is before Christians leave the earth or after, we don't know. Now, do I think that the economy is going to totally tank right now, like in the next six months? Probably not. I know that, I don't know if the numbers actually came out, but I know that they're pretty sure that we are definitely in a recession despite what the White House wants to say. Did you hear about that? I heard that. I heard that. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention it The too. definition of recession stayed the same for 100 years they until this week. It. Yeah, now they changed it. <laughs> Three months before the elections. A little convenient <laughs> there if you ask me. Um, but right now, we are nowhere near a complete collapse or depression or anything like well, that. Well, I think unless we have something like during the Great Depression when all of a sudden within one day, boom, something weird happens. I think the way we're headed, it's just gradually going to go downhill more and more and more like a snowball. You know, it's just going to get a little bit bigger and worse going downhill. So I don't think it's going to ever be as prosperous as it was. It would take an awful lot to pull us back. I just don't think we can pull back out of trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of debt mm -hmm. and money being printed. I just See, don't think it's possible. This has been coming up for a while, for several years, the debt they've been borrowing and that type of thing. So Now, here's why I'm afraid of Americans. <laughs> now, I know Jesus. So I guess I'm lying when I say I'm afraid of Americans. <laughs> but what I'm afraid of is people are literally losing their minds yeah it is like nothing we've ever seen and i was posting in monday's video about how um you know all these fires these food plant fires oh it's a conspiracy the government's burning them all down well come to find out that's normal for food plants to have fires for those of you who don't know, wheat and oils are very volatile. We used to live in farmland. Actually, we all used to live in farmland. And silos were always catching mm -hmm. on fire it was and exploding. It continual danger, yeah. It, it's a very big danger. Mm -hmm. But all these supposed conspiracy fires that are happening, it's really nothing out of the ordinary. It's the same amount of fires they've always had. And what's frustrating is some of those weren't even food plants. <laughs> like three of them weren't even food plants. And I think it was 12 out of the 26 that I looked, they were up in production the same day or just in a couple of days. It didn't affect them at all. And so it's things like that that I was talking about in this video. Well, then I was talking about, okay, you know, everybody's freaking out about how much wheat or how much the farmers weren't going to have any wheat this year. We weren't going to have any, um, we weren't going to have any food left being produced or farmed in the United States. So I read um, the wheat projection, projections for 2022. This came out in July, I believe it was. And it said that um, winter wheat is up let's see winter wheat is up two percent durham wheat is up a hundred and seven percent 
Spring wheat is up 52%. Barley is up 49%. And oats are up 32%. I said, I don't, we're going to have food. I really think we're going to have food. So the number one comment in Monday's video, the number one comment was, yes, but we're shipping it all to China. China's taking it all. The government's sending it all to China. Okay. <laughs> Get it together, people. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> she was speechless, so you helped her out. <laughs> you know, Mike and Mom she just and didn't I. Have a place to smack the table. That's yeah, she did. Oh. The table's totally full. <laughs> you know, Mike and Mom and I we were talking about this yesterday and we were just like, okay, all three of us have to get on here because we all three have different kind of perspectives on this and different um, input on this. Although we do agree. <laughs> we all agree on this. We but just we have come at different, different angle. angles. And we were talking yesterday and we were like, you know what? People have got to get a grip. You just have to get a grip. And I let me just preface this by saying we are not naive enough to not think anything at all is happening. Mm -hmm. Yes, things are falling into place for a one world government, a one world religion, a one world currency, digital currency that they, they have already said that they are planning on doing digital currency. Why? That way they can control us for this green baloney that they think is going on in the world. There is no such thing as the climate issues that they're having happening in the world, but they're using this as an excuse to have all these things together. We know that. We know everything is falling into place, just like the Bible predicted it would. The Bible says we're going to have a one world government. We're going to have a one world uh, monetary system. We're going to have a cashless system. We are going to have a one world religion. We already know all those things are falling into place. But here's the thing. You really can't do anything about it. <laughs> um, well, you can vote. And in the United States, you can vote and you can do your part. But in the grand scheme of things, you really can't do anything about it. So what good is it going to do you to be watching all of these things and literally scaring yourself to death? You're getting so stressed out that you're mm -hmm. getting heart disease, high blood pressure. You're eating your way to diabetes because you're so stressed out from this stuff. There is nothing you can do except prepare as much as you can for you and your family and do what you can. But after that, it's going to be you and Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, it's just going to be you trying to figure it out. And so we kind of wanted to talk about this a little bit today, give you guys a little bit of maybe hope that it's not quite as bad as it seems it is, even though it's bad, it's not quite as bad as it seems it is. So, yes, dear. <laughs> I was just gonna say, the stuff that Tara was talking about, uh, you know, the Bible says these things will happen before the end, but we don't know that that's now. And it could be, might not be, but a lot of people panicking and the thing is that they're panicking because they're hearing things from people that they really have no idea if they're true or not. Our culture's kind of come down to where, in fact, the whole world has kind of come down to where if a lot of people are saying it, it's judged to be true. And that, that just isn't logical. In yeah, whether any kind it's of true way. or not. Whether it's true or not. You know, there was a time in the world where the majority of people thought it was flat, but that wasn't true. And so just because everybody's saying something on the internet doesn't mean it's true and as tara was saying it's helpful to recognize you can't 
there's a lot of stuff you can't do anything about. And so those things, you just try to, you know, deal with the situation in your life with your family. I mean, if you want to, if it's really, really important to you, a lot of this stuff, then you need to become a politician and recruit a bunch of people to become politicians and go change it. And if it's not worth that, but you just want to watch videos about terrible things happening and, and then commenting on it, you're not accomplishing anything doing that. It's not going to help your fear. It's not going to help anything. It's just basically wasting time. It's, it's like, a, well, I wasn't going to say what the issue was, but Tara's great-grandfather had made some comment about didn't have time Okay. Oh, yeah. So here's the story. A family member had made an announcement about, let's see, how do I say this? <laughs> a family- a Politically correct issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some, some basically sin that they were doing in their life and they didn't really care and they were going to continue to do that sin. And my great grandfather, when this person told them that, he said, you know, back in my day, we were too busy working, working to have any time to fool with that kind of stuff. And you know, he's right. Part of the problem right now is people do not have enough work to do. Too much they sitting really in front don't. of a computer commenting on the world. Well, I was just gonna say- Instead of actually living a life. Just recently, you know, I got a comment from someone and they sent me, it was about three, I mean, big long paragraphs. They typed out carefully with all this information three long paragraphs and they were very stressed out about the subject and making sure I knew that, you know, what I said was totally wrong and they were just very stressed about it. I could hear the fear in the words, you know, and see it was just, she just went on and on and on and on and on. It was just building up more. And I thought, first of all, how in the world does anybody have that much time to sit on make a comment on a YouTube channel to write three long paragraphs. I wouldn't have had time to even write one paragraph. What are you doing with your life if you're just sitting there going from YouTube channel to YouTube channel making comments? I so I very rarely make a comment. If I do make a comment, it's always, you did a great job, thank you so much for doing this, period. I don't have time to sit and write three paragraphs, huge paragraphs. And, and so I got to thinking, I think people are just, they're too busy on the internet, just vegging out. And it's, it used to be years ago, well, this is going to translate into something that I was going to want to say anyway. It used to be that we didn't watch the news and watch was on there 24 hours. 24 hours. And we would get news at like, five o'clock in the evening and 10 o'clock at night on TV. And you'd watch it either at the five o'clock or the 10 o'clock. That was it. And it was about 30 minutes long. Half of that was weather. And the other fourth was local stuff. And you just got a little bit of what's going on. Then, and even before that, they would just listen to a short program on the radio. You'd get the newspaper maybe once a week, sometimes twice a week and in smaller towns and things. So you looked at the paper. It was mostly once again, slow local stuff. You didn't know what was going on. You knew a little bit, but it was just like a blurb on the screen of what was going on in Europe here in the States. We did, you know, we knew something was happening, but you just read it once or heard about it once in the evening. You didn't get any pictures of anything most of the time. Very Newspapers would sometimes have a picture, but we didn't have where the live stuff that's happening right here at the moment. It's such and such. So why I'm telling you this is you are in news overload. You really are. And YouTube overload. You're sitting there. You're studying all your, uh, okay, this is happening. So you study all this stuff. I shouldn't be eating this. So you study all this stuff. I shouldn't be you know, having my finances with this. So you're studying all this stuff on YouTube. You are getting so much garbage into your mind and spending your time wallowing in garbage is what it boils down to. God didn't design us to know, I don't think, what was going on everywhere in the world, all the trauma, all the gross, everything. 24-7. 24-7. Yep. Our minds yep. 
and our emotions just can't take it. And because of that, you have to do, you're the one that has to control it. There's nothing we can do about it to stop all of this stuff. You've got to decide what you're going to watch, what you're going to do, how long you're going to spend doing it. I've cut my TV watching down to almost nothing now, almost nothing. And even my YouTube stuff, I'm down to only fun things like watching quilting shows or something like that. Even some of the quilting shows I've had to not do for different reasons. You, you've got to take, you've got to be responsible for, and stop giving into this fear and being paranoid and going on and on. You, you will collapse. And another thing, I'm so frustrated. Oh dear, I wasn't going to say a word tonight, was I? Didn't I say I would just sit here? <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting over here patiently. <laughs> I know. A couple questions well, I'm so frustrated because I get so much information because it's our business. This is going to kill you. I mean, it started out a few years ago. The red dye was going to kill us, you know. And then if you ate butter, it was going to kill you. And then they changed it over. If you eat margarine, it's going to kill you. I tell you, everything in our food is going to kill us that we eat. I should have been dead 50 years ago at the rate of stuff I'm eating and stuff like that. But you can't get in the, the stress. What I'm trying to say is the stress from worrying about this, worrying what's in my food, Worrying if the find that everything's going to crash and burn. Worrying it might crash and burn. Well, you don't need to worry as much if you're out of debt. If you got some groceries gathered up, and if you know how to live frugally, let it crash and burn. You're okay. And I think that's part of what's wrong. People are not prepared emotionally. They're not prepared physically. And they're just, they just have learned to be stressed over and afraid of stuff. Am I talking too much? Is that what you're laughing at? No, Jonathan and, says red dyed margarine with NutraSweet will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, that's a really see, good one. Red dyed you know margarine well, with NutraSweet. What would that be? That would be diet Kool-Aid maybe? I don't know. That's good. That's too good. But you know. Yeah, you need to laugh once in a while. I am so sick of everybody being so intense. Well, yeah, and so people serious. need to take a laugh. Right. When Jonathan, my goodness. Jonathan well. says, says something like that, some of you will get in a huff and a puff and be uh, insulted by it. Get a grip, people, and get a sense of humor. We have no sense of humor anymore, so nobody's laughing. They Do you know comedians are going out of business now? Because they cannot make jokes about things. They're going out of business. You can't joke about anything. No. Well, actually, I was going to say something that I, I've mentioned before. I was a, a television producer for 20 years, and there's, and I tried to avoid news. I never really worked in the news, but I can tell you that there's nothing in the news that's true. It's some of it's sort of true, and some of it's not. It's all somebody's opinion. And there are people that I've known who have said, I just have to know what's going on. Actually, you don't. I, I was thinking they can say, People say, I have to know what's going on, and they're saying things that are scaring me, and what am I going to do? And I, was, and I just want to let you know, they can say scary things. They can broadcast them to the world. They can go on the Internet and say it everywhere and post it on Facebook, but you don't have to listen. Mm -hmm. It's a choice you have mm -hmm. to say, I'm not going to be part of this. I, I'm not going to listen to it. And you know what? Tara follows a lot of this stuff like to get ideas for videos and things, and I really don't because... For me, it's highly stressful to pay attention to that he stuff. He doesn't all the even time. watch my videos. <laughs> I, I mean, he doesn't every, even know what I put out. <laughs> every now and then, usually it's when she says, Hey, what do you think of this video? And you're like, That's really awesome. But the reason I'm saying that is because people feel like they have to watch this stuff. And you don't, you don't really need, we have this sense that because now the internet's here and all this information is available out there, that somehow if we know it, we have some control over the world that we don't have. And a lot of these things that are happening, like the people were commenting on fires at food plants. Well, it's not what you think it is. It's, it's not what the conspiracy people are saying it is. But the thing is, people are aware of it now, and they just weren't aware of those things happening before. I worked at a grocery store, and there's a certain allowable amount of Go ahead, tell them. Bug parts and other things that are allowed poop. in food. There is a certain amount of bug poop. I will it's, say it. It's legally allowed bug in food. Poop. And the reason why is because there's really no way for food producers to filter it all out. It's a small amount, 
but it's there. That's why you cook the and, vegetables. But, but the thing is, you didn't know that. Most of you didn't know that five minutes ago. And if you grow your own, and, you still have bird poop. And did you really bird. need to know that? Like, have you food. died from the food you're eating because of it? No. But now that you know it, you have to be careful not to run off the tracks worrying about it. And that's the thing I'm, I'm realizing is people want to feel like they're in control of something. And another thing I was going to comment on, um, well, first of all, I was going to just briefly mention, um, Hasa Makwadi said, some of, some of us are disabled and all we have is our YouTube communities. So what I was saying about that is not you can't watch no. YouTube or you, you pick can, the kind you, you can't want do things at control home. Control it. Control what it. I was saying is if you're at home and you're unable to, I mean, I would still do everything you can do, but it's, but you can choose which things to watch and what things to engage in. The problem that I was having is people that just hear rumors and then they spread the rumors and they become part of somebody else's justification for believing the rumors that aren't even true. And so what I was getting at is, uh, I forgot, <laughs> a lot of these things, uh, it's just people are saying things that, so some of the things people are saying could be true, but I think the majority of them are not. And the thing is, in order to find out if it's important to you to know, important enough to tell everyone that it's true, you should do some research. And um, Denise said a lot of people working hard with children, working two jobs, go to church, plus their laundry, have little time to do research like you all do. Fine. Well, then how are you hearing this stuff? No, no, it's fine. If, if you don't have time to do research, then don't say it's true if you don't know. You could hear somebody say it and say, well, maybe that's true. I'll just keep it and take it with a grain of salt and see what happens in the future. But if you don't know, don't tell people. Because what we get is people all the time saying, well, everybody knows that this is happening. And thinking, no, everybody doesn't know. Like the food plants thing. People... <laughs> We've all been connected to agriculture in this family. And the, the stuff that was happening there, if you look at the list of things that actually happened, most of them didn't burn down. There were fires, but they didn't burn down. Some of them, there was a plane that crashed into a bunch of empty trailers next to a plant. One plant that burned, there was nothing there. It was totally vacant. It had previously been a food plant. But people take these things and they don't research them. And... When you don't, and I, there was a person that when the whole cows thing happened, I noticed that's completely blown over and nobody's even looking for it on the internet anymore. <laughs> but when the whole cows thing happened where, was it a thousand cows or something? Two thousand, yeah. In, in Kansas dropped dead. Um, I heard people saying, well, I, don't, I just don't know, but I know it must be true because all the food plants are burning down. So what they're doing is they're taking an assertion that a lot of people made that doesn't appear to be true if you look at the evidence, and they're using that assertion as evidence to prove other things that don't appear to be true. Because <laughs> what we've realized is when we were in Kansas, there were things that would happen all the time like that. Like in the wintertime, thousands of cows died because of an ice storm. It's part of agriculture. But 2,000 cows dying nationwide is really not significant over the whole country. It's really sad for the farmer involved. But it was interesting because actually now I have to go back and see. I actually took some quotes. Uh, <clears throat> okay, hold on. I have a, Linda said this, and I, this is excellent. She said, as I pray about this, I'm reminded that occupy until I come is not equal to panic, stress, fear until I come. Exactly. That hits Perfect. it on the Perfect. nail on the head. That is exactly it. And especially it. Christians. It perfect. That's perfect. I can understand if you're not a Christian, you do not have the assurance that mm. Jesus is going, that God promises to take care or... of you. But I, I get that if you're not a Christian, but as Christians, you should be ashamed of yourself for listening to this fecal matter. It's a temptation. For letting it come into you. It is as bad as letting porn, porn come into I was just going to say, your, I can't believe I was getting, yeah. while Michael it's was talking, temptation. I was going to say, just like you, any can, other temptation. you have to have control of this, like they say to have control of porn, watching porn on here. Do you go on there and watch porn all the time? If you're a Christian, you shouldn't be. You need to, con you need to control your mind and control that stuff. And this is just like porn in a different 
way. You can do all kinds of things with this. You know, if you're worried about your physical body all the time, you can obsess and spend hours looking at physical ailments, you know, unreal on here. You just can take anything, anything. If you spend hours watching on here, it's like porn, you know, is, and you've got to control it. And if you're not controlling it, it's just as wrong as you, not controlling porn. Actually, I was going to keep a finish up on the cow thing. I'm not going to make a huge deal, but but Kelly said, I'm from South Dakota. A few years back, 12,000 cows died in a blizzard. Never heard a blip mm -hmm. about yep. it in the news then. Yeah. Same thing when happened we were in, in Colorado. Kansas, when we were in Kansas, it happened, and it was on the Kansas news, and yep. that was all. And the other thing I was going to quickly say on that is I just happened to look today at some of the videos. And it's funny because now people aren't really talking about the cows thing anymore. But um, oh, where do they put it now? <laughs> okay. Um, I was looking at some of it in the the headlines it were thousands of cattle suspiciously die. Well, why do you say it's suspiciously? Like, just because you don't understand it, it's suspicious. Somebody else had this rancher just reported something big happened on this cattle ranch. Well, I just happened to watch some of his video. Well, most of his video. And first of all, he's an English guy commenting on the thing in Kansas. And um, he didn't have any quotes from the rancher. He just had a, a voiceover, oh, terrible things happening in the world, and blah, blah, blah. And then he happened to use, it sounded like he was trying to use it as evidence that this has happened to several other ranchers in the region. Well, you know, when it's 110 degrees outside mm -hmm. and your cows are standing in the sun and they don't have any water, they're going to die. Especially and when so, they're extremely overweight from being fed so much because they're ready to go to yeah, slaughter. So when other ranchers in the same region have the problem, See, people look at this stuff as evidence, and it's not evidence. If you want evidence, you have to look. And like on some of these things, like the fires, if you, instead of looking at some YouTuber who makes their money selling scary stuff about prepping, <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's good to say, hmm, wow, that is kind of scary what they said. It sounds pretty scary to me. It sounds legit. But then go find out which exact plants are they talking about and look at the local news and the police department, the fire department reports and see what they say. If you really wanna know, if, if it's not that important to you, then I wouldn't even talk about it and then I let it go because it's just gossip otherwise. Well, and it's being blown out of proportion. I ran a manufacturing business for a while. We had stuff go wrong all the time. We had flood in our, you know, where we were manufacturing, we lost lots of parts and everything. Uh, we, we, the drip, machinery would break down. Different things would happen constantly when you have a manufacturing business. When you're producing things, things go wrong. And for some reason, it felt like with this wheat, uh, with the, uh, the processing plants, it was like they just took, nobody had known anything about any of this stuff ever happening to these places, even though they did happen. It was never mentioned in all the news for years past. Nobody made a big deal of it, even if it was mentioned. Now, all of a sudden, you take something that's an ordinary, everyday occurrence, and we're blowing it out of proportion. It just starts. It's like the game of gossip. One person tells somebody something, and they tell the next person. It gets even bigger, and the next person gets bigger and bigger and bigger, until it's so distorted by the time most people hear it. It's just ridiculous, you know? And that's what was happening with this, with a lot of stuff now, because of the Internet. And once again, you just have to control it. Well, and one person was saying uh, something about um, how people will maybe need to discuss it in a different place because it just stresses us out here. It doesn't stress us out here. It doesn't stress us out. What we find str troubling, though, is that people are people's reaction killing to themselves. People's reaction to it. People yeah. are killing themselves with stress over worrying about these things, and they're probably gonna die before any of the stuff they're talking about happens, if it ever happens at all. And it's worse than the illness that we have. It's like a disease of the mind and emotions, and it's getting rampant and out of control, and it's very contagious, very contagious. It's just, everybody's grabbing onto it. And so we never talk about the things like this, diseases of the mind and the emotions going around. Now, everybody went into lockdown, because of this illness, physical illness. But this is the same type of thing that's happening. It's just going crazy. 
Mike, could you move that fan a little bit? It's blowing right in my eyes, and I feel like I'm crying. I'm sorry. I hated to make you. Okay. So, so, so anyway, the idea is we're. Thank you. Well, I just, I just want to make sure I confirm the fact that what we're telling you is, if you just believe a lot of things without verifying that it's the truth, then you're sharing a lot of things that you don't know are true, and they're probably not, and you're getting yourself all wound up about it, and you're likely to have medical problems and die before the problem that you're worried about actually happens. And that's what we're trying to encourage people to just, if you're not willing to do research to find the original sources yourself, just don't worry about it. And really, if you watch the news, would any of it actually really affect you? Yeah, you'd go see the gas prices were up at the gas station. You would see that groceries were up. Maybe your electric bill or gas bill would go up. Other than that, would any of it affect you? No, it would not. And you cannot tell me it would affect you because it wouldn't. And you have got to keep it in perspective and stop worrying about your rest of the world and worry about what you can do for you and, and your, family. About your family. Well, you know, actually, what are you doing to your kids with all this stuff? Go out to the park and play with your kids instead of sitting and stewing over this. Go out and do something. Call a friend and just chit chat, chit chat about nonsense. You can't just spend hours and hours of thinking about this and worrying about it and being anxious. It's like, was it Linda that said occupy? You know, yeah. we're supposed to occupy. Okay, hold on. Donna says, and inflation isn't a problem. I didn't say it wasn't a problem. You no. would notice that inflation has happened. But if you didn't watch the news, you would see your prices have gone up. But none of that other baloney would even matter. Yeah. And it would be less stressful than following all the other stuff. So then you focus on what you can do mm -hmm. to fix your finances. So when the inflation comes, it doesn't hurt you as much as it could. If you're in debt, if you're eating out all the time, if you have car loans, if you are um, buying groceries that you don't need to be buying. It's kind of like I'm from Kansas or was from Kansas. Okay. What we did in Kansas, we had tornadoes. And I could have said, you know, come May, worrying about, oh, dear, there's going to be storms coming. The tornadoes, what am I going to do with the tornado hits me? I, my house, is, is it sturdy enough? I don't think so. They said we're going to have an extra amount of tornadoes, and I could just worry and worry and worry. Instead, I had a basement. I had a special closet. I had things in the closet that I would need if a tornado hit me. And I got everything ready and prepared. When the tornado was getting ready to come to town and they'd show it on the weather, I wasn't in a panic before it even hit. I was calm and I listened to what they were saying was happening. I went into my basement and did everything that I needed to do. And it was no big deal. And that's where you're going wrong. You're, you're worrying and stewing and the tornado may not even come and hit your house. But you can be, if you're prepared, even if it might be heading your direction, you can be calm about it. You can think about what you need to do and take care of it and get it taken care of. When you're anxious and worried and fearful, you can't do anything about anything. Okay. I'm going to read this letter that we got from one of our viewers wait, wait. because this I proves wanna, the point. You said something I didn't quite finish. Tar was talking about if you didn't know something that had happened, uh, would it really affect you? And I wanted to comment on that because we had a discussion with our uh, between each other recently, and we said if we didn't know anything that had been broadcast in the news or said on social media in the last 30 years, would our lives have really been different? Would our experience have been different in terms of money and our stuff? And no, it wouldn't have. Like we recognized at times, man, Yes, 387 a gallon. It's never been that high before. That's absolutely crazy. But we can't really do much, so we have to readjust our budget to fix that. Mm -hmm. In our own lives. places, yeah. And all those there, there were some pretty large world events that happened in that time. And it might be useful to have some awareness that it's there. But if we didn't know, our lives would not have been any different. And that's the thing that you should consider that in your own life. Like how much. If you are a person who watches a lot of those things and follows all of that, has your life really been different because you're on guard all the time? Okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> all right, this is from Carrie in Ireland. And we oh, have talked hey, about Carrie, Carrie, Hi, Carrie. A, a couple of times, but I got this letter several weeks ago, and we're going to actually do an individual video on this. 
But I was like, this is exactly what we are talking about today. Dear Tara, Mike, and Jill, I can't believe I'm writing this, but here we go. Thanks to your thrifty advice and gentle kick up in the butt motivation, I'm writing this from my own home. As I have shared previously two and a half years ago, I was in intensive care, flat broke, unable to walk and talk. Even with that thing going around, I have been able to change my life, and that is no small part thanks to you. I have to say, I have been getting a bit annoyed with some of the comments you've been receiving lately from people who seem to want to keep asking you question after question as a delaying tactic rather than just starting. I am in no way perfect, but I started out this journey towards purchasing my home with possibly every obstacle in my past. I have a terminal I have a terminal diagnosis. She has an illness and they expect her to die fairly soon. Having lost the ability to walk and talk and having to relearn both, having to fund experimental medication to keep me going, working full time, dealing with a feeding tube. Oh, and the global pandemic that brought the world to a standstill. As someone with a genetic terminal diagnosis, I am not legally allowed a mortgage and there was just aren't accessible homes to rent. So our only hope of purchasing a house was to do so outright. This is no easy task, but I wanted to share with you that it is the small decisions in life rather than waiting for everything to be perfect that matters. I've noticed lots of people asking questions and criticizing because they seem to want everything to be perfect. Well, that perfect time to change one's life will never exist. Even with our house right now, we can only make the money work by Airbnb being the upstairs. Yes, this isn't perfect, but yes, it's working. But it's a step towards our dream. I wish people would see that you are not the answer to their issues, but a guide map to changing their lives. It was small steps you inspired me to take that rolled into a huge change of now being debt free and owning a house. Across Europe, our electricity has been raised by 25%, which is quite a lot. So I went back and rewatched some of your videos on managing my laundry so I can reduce my washing machine use. I've got rid of my dryer and am solar, solely air drying. These are things that I can change. I've made a, I have made a lot of your advice my routine so that I barely notice it. It's these small steps that contribute to the overall change. I think lots of people watching you want an easy fix and then bizarrely blame you and your wonderful mom for not being there to fix everything for them. I hope you always know how much I will always be grateful for God directing me into your life. You share your story with integrity and honesty. And there are many people like me who appreciate you. This woman is dying. And living a life that almost everyone would be complaining about. Yet she isn't sitting there. Watching and filling her mind with a bunch of junk. She is making a decision on what she is watching. She is making a decision on what she is putting in her mind. She is making a decision to hang her clothes on the clothesline instead of using the dryer. How many people in the United States are complaining about their electric bill, but are not hanging their clothes out to dry? I guarantee you it's 99%. The problem is, yes, there are a lot of things going on. But there are a lot of things you can do to help your situation, improve your situation, to do what you can. I totally understand you may be on social security or disability or something like that, but there is something you can do. Even if it's just making sure you only shop the sales and the clearance aisles. I know that probably 95% of the people on disability, they can hang their clothes on the clothesline. Wear clothes rack. They can use a clothes rack in the house for a year. Mom still hangs all of her clothes on the clothesline for 20, 
plus years. I never had a dryer and I only hung my clothes on the clothesline or uh, put them on a rack. But is anybody willing to do that? And so, yes, I understand inflation is happening and inflation is a problem. But it's not like you can't do anything to help yourself at all. And, you know, you're going to do things like we put in a, a big garden this year. Well, guess what? The birds ate half my seeds. Then the rabbits got in and ate half my plants. Then we had a horrid hailstorm. <laughs> then what else happened? Something else just happened. I can't remember what it was, but <laughs> my point is I worked and worked and worked and got this huge garden put in and I'm maybe going to get an eighth of the harvest that I should get from this garden. Well, okay, I'm not going to have the garden I thought I would. So I will figure out other things. Mom and I were going to dehydrate the peppers and tomatoes. I will figure out other ways to have a garden. I've only got about six or eight weeks left of gardening season. I'm not going to get much this year. You could put a fence around the neighbors and add it to our yard. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, things are going to happen. But you can always do something to help yourself. And even if you are on disability, I do not put up with the baloney that if you're on disability, there's absolutely nothing you can do. Why? Because I've done it. <laughs> I have been so sick that I have spent 95% of my day in bed, literally in bed. For years. For years. But what did I do? Every commercial, I got up, I did the dishes. Next commercial, I went and laid down and watched more TV. Next commercial, I went and threw the laundry in the, in. well, I took the laundry to the washing machine. Went and sat down. Next commercial, put the laundry in the washing machine. Next commercial, moved it from the washer to dryer or whatever. You can do something. And then it eventually got to the point where I went from being totally bedridden to saying, I cannot live like this. I refuse to live like this. There has got to be something I can do to help myself feel better to the point where over the last 15 years or so, I have done Tons and tons and tons of different medical things, food elimination, antibiotics, different things to help myself feel better. It took years, but I am not bedridden anymore. I'm not cured, but I'm certainly not bedridden like I was. That's why we have zero patients, zero. <laughs> With people who say, I'm on disability, I'm on social security, there's absolutely nothing I could do. Yes, there are things you can do. You just choose not to do them, period. Well, actually, I'm not gonna, I won't say exactly what it is, but I am aware that there are things that Carrie did not write in that letter where she actually is doing a lot more to help mm -hmm. other people mm -hmm. with her story. Mm -hmm. And, and she's she's also not she's probably stretching all that she has to live the life that the best life she can with where she is. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the fact that she's not only dealing with her own life in the way that she described there, but that she's also reaching out and helping a lot of other people. I, I think that is really amazing. And we should look at that and and realize, particularly if we're in even moderately good health, we have no reason to complain. Yeah, I <clears throat> I heard, um, I think it was Johnny Eric, Erickson. I told uh, this yeah. story before. Um, she was visiting a woman that was totally bedridden. She was completely blind, paralyzed from the neck down and everything. 
And the woman told her, she said, what use am I? Why is God even keeping me alive? I can't do anything. And she told her, she said, are you praying for other people? Are you praying for anybody else? Or are you just sitting there thinking about how, well, you know, poor little old me. And even if you're in that kind of a condition, you can start praying for somebody else. And you'll be so shocked that once you do that, things will change in your life like you can't imagine. Well, I still can't move or I still can't do this. You, your attitude will change and it will change everything. And maybe you can't do anything in your life to help you. But why not pray for somebody else and help them? At least, at least do that amount. You know, there's always something. It can be little or small that God's keeping you here and he's wanting you to do. And you might as well step up to the plate and do it, you know, instead of just wallowing. Yep. Yep. Oh. <laughs> no, I mean, I tell you, Carrie, just the com she blows my mind away. And we have a lot of viewers out here that are un that are just like that. And, you know, so it's hard for us to not get upset and frustrated and even angry sometimes at some of the comments we get from these people that have everything that have everything from what they tell us. Don't say we're judging. They tell us what they have exactly, and yet they're whining and complaining. So, oh, there was something that I thought of, and I can't remember what it was. Uh oh, something bad just was. No, happening. no, it was good. It was about what what we were saying, but it'll come back to me. So anyway, um, we're actually here to encourage you. <laughs> you know, it may not be an encouragement, but it sounds like it is for a lot of people. Um. Okay. Can I say something? Real yeah, quick? go ahead. I I heard something the other day, and this is what, when Tara was talking about, you know, overload on, we did a video on overload prepping or something. It was that last week, maybe. And I heard somebody else say this on another thing. You need to take a break. You need to give yourself a heart break, an emotional break, and step aside from the prepping, step aside from worrying what's happening in the world, go on a picnic for one day, for two days, don't look at your computer and just enjoy the life you have at this moment because tomorrow could be bad. Tomorrow it could be bad. I know that for a fact. In a split second, your life can change so drastically. You can go to that doctor for a regular physical and come home and your whole world has changed. So stop worrying about that and what could happen and not enjoying today. I mean, why are you worrying today because of what could happen tomorrow? You need to start enjoying today a little bit. Do something fun, read a good book, laugh, find something. If you're gonna be on the internet, find something that makes you laugh and do something like that because tomorrow may be hard but you'll have built yourself up emotionally and relaxed your heart and your emotions and mind so that you could face the fight tomorrow if you have to. Yep. Uh, hey, I was going to, I remembered what I was going to say, but before I do, Barbara said, I love my cookbooks that you guys sent me. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Good, Barbara. Barbara. They are 50% off right now. Oops, Just Tara's going to be 50 oh, years old. Tomorrow I'm going to be 50, 50 years old. <laughs> um, I realize I've been sharing the 25% off. Notes. It's actually 50% off. Mike's been putting the wrong thing in there. Um, and uh, let's see. I, I do want to say that when you get a moment. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Well, Rebecca just said, I love it when you tell people to get it together. Thank you. I needed to hear this today. Just lost my job. And oh, it's sorry. unfortunate. Yeah. It's, sorry to hear that you lost your job. Uh, but you reminded me of something I had intended to say earlier, which is when I was saying we look back over 30 years and we realized if we hadn't watched the news, our lives would not be any worse off. In fact, they probably would have been better because we wouldn't have been worrying about it and filling our lives with that. We probably would have gotten 50 percent more stuff done. But the other thing that I was going to mention after as uh, Rebecca says that she lost her job. It's funny because we paid off a lot of debt over time, but. There were times where something would happen and I lost my job one time 
and it wasn't an economy issue. It was just an issue at the university where I worked with their crazy payroll or um, hiring things. But anyway, um, there have been other times where we crashed a car. Not not really our fault. Well, it wasn't our fault. And um, there are other things that happen like that. And so we just realized, oops, we're moving forward, we're moving forward, we're moving forward. Oops, we're set back some now. Okay, we're going to move forward and move forward and move forward. Oh, we're set back again. And at, at times it felt like we're moving forward and then the setback is just as far back as we started from before. But we just kept doing that all the time and try to have a positive attitude about mm -hmm. it. And eventually we got to where we are now, where, where we started a year after we started. Well, Jill and Tara had struggles before I met Tara, but a year after Tara and I got, a couple years after we got married, we had no refrigerator. And we, we told everybody the story about having to decide whether or not to eat the, the meat that the cat attacked. <laughs> um, and now we're in a much better situation in a house that we like a lot. And it's all because every time there was a setback, we just kept trying to think, okay, how can we move forward from this? Yeah, we would be upset about it. We'd say, oh, I'm just so devastated that this happened. It's just mm -hmm. sad. And after a couple of days, like, okay, we need to stop sulking and we need to get out there and figure out how to move forward again. And, and doing that, eventually you will make a lot of forward progress. And the more you make, the easier it comes. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to add that part. Now, whatever you were, forgot about. Well, sorry. So last week, we almost lost one of our kids. Because there was a violent crime committed against them. And they're okay. And we're not going to give details. But let me tell you, it really puts things in perspective. Thank you, Carrie, for wrapping your <laughs> oh, it <laughs> It's from Carrie's. It's an Irish tissue. <laughs> Irish tissue from that Carrie. Definitely make but it. when you face the fact that your child came very close to dying, You realize none of this is worth it. It is not worth stressing yourself out over things that you cannot control. Over the wheat, whether it's going to China or not, or the cows dying in Kansas. When there's no food, okay, worry about it. But there is food right now. You can stock up right now. You can do things to help yourself right now. And I watch a lot of these prepper people just for ideas for the show and stuff. And it doesn't bother me. I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty tough on that. <laughs> but 95% of what they're talking about even if it's happening, there's nothing you can do about it. So you might as well just focus on yourself. And God. And if you're not right with God, you need to get right with God. And I know we keep preaching this and preaching this, but you know, Jesus is coming back soon. And when the seven year tribulation hits, it's literally going to be Hades in a handbasket. It everything is going to break loose. And it's going to be such unbelievable horror. People will be literally dying because their hearts cannot handle the stress of it. 
They're going to be dying by the billions from natural disasters and things that are going to be happening. It's going to happen. And the reason why we as Christians are not worried about it is because we know that God has promised to take care of us. That no matter what happens, if there's no food, like my great grandmother had when she was a child, my great grandmother told the story about how they had to take a neighbor kid in because his parents had died. And it had snowed really bad. They couldn't get supplies. And they had sent their dad 50 miles away on snowshoes to try and go get supplies. He had been gone three weeks and they had literally eaten their last meal. There was literally nothing left for food in the house at all. There was nothing left. It was the middle of winter. They couldn't get out. They were literally snowed in. They went without food. I think it was for one day. And guess what? Their dad came back. And at 80, she was like 85 or 87, somewhere around there when she was telling me that, she still had tears in her eyes. Remembering how God took care of them. And as Christians, we know that we will be taken care of. Now, we also know that we're going to get criticized. And we are going to get laughed at. And we're going to get called crazy. But you know what? That's okay. <laughs> because we don't care. <laughs> our job is to let you know that Jesus died for your sins. God is a judging God. The person that committed the crime against my child, I expect a judge to sentence them. We commit crimes against God all the time. We lie. We steal. We're lustful. We take the Lord's name in vain. Why should we expect a, an earthly judge to judge someone who's committed a crime against us, but God shouldn't judge us for committing crimes against him? He is a judging God, and we are all going to be judged. But he sent Jesus to die on the cross to be our sacrifice in place of us so that if we give our life to him, believe in him, we have 100% assurance that when we get to heaven, our sins are remembered no more. Uh, yeah, is it judged. Hebrews? I think it's 8, 12 or 12, 8. I can't remember. We are not going to be judged for our sins in heaven as Christians. As believers in Jesus Christ, we are not going to be judged for our sins. We're going to be judged for the things that we do on this earth to bring people to Jesus. And let me tell you, I would not wish on my worst enemy what's going to be happening when Christ comes back and takes the church up and we're gone during the tribulation. It's going to be awful. But we have an out and God has given us an out. It's just whether you want to accept it or not. And there is no sin that you can commit that he will not forgive. And people have a hard time with that. Mm -hmm. But if you really come to that relationship with him, you won't, you'll still sin, but you won't just recklessly do all kinds of horrible, terrible things. If, if you say you have a relationship with Christ and then you go out and act like Hitler for five years, then that probably says you don't have that relationship and you're deceived. So, but if you have committed some kind of awful sin that you just don't think God will forgive you for, he will forgive you for. He'll forgive you for anything. The only the some people ask us sometimes about the unforgivable sin that the Bible mentions and that the only unforgivable sin is rejecting God. There's nothing else. 
And so he will accept you no matter what. And it's, it's interesting because even though we were worried for our child in that situation, um, we don't really feel hateful toward the person. No, well, I've because, actually been praying for them. Uh, yeah, because, because that, person for is, that person is being manipulated by the devil for toward his destruction. And all he has to do is know Christ, and that will completely change. God will forgive it all. And God calls us to forgive it all as believers. And so um, if you're in a situation, because there are a lot of people that say, I just don't think God will forgive me what I've done, or I have to make myself right enough before God. No, you can't make yourself right enough. The Bible says none are righteous, not, not one, that all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And um, based on that, all you can do is say, if, you, if you're feeling, wow, I really would like God in my life, I just I'm, I don't think I'm good enough for him. You just need to say, I, I'm going to follow you, and I, I, I don't know what's going to happen with this stuff. You're just going to have to take it from me. That's what he wants. He doesn't want just you to fix him. yourself. Yeah. He just wants you to ask him, walk with him, have a relationship with him. You can't, you can't fix yourself. Huh? Yeah. Believe in what he did for you on the cross. Mm -hmm. And that's all. The You don't have to make yourself right. By I, saying I have to fix myself, I have to do some work in order to make it right, you're kind of spitting in the face of Jesus after all he did and went through. So you wouldn't have to do that. You're really insulting him, you know. But that thing that you... I, I, I'm not, maybe not all of you are feeling this, but I know there are people out there and they're just feeling like something that they've done in their lives they just feel horribly guilty about. God would never forgive that. He will forgive that. Mm -hmm. You just have to come and let him go. His word promises he will forgive mm -hmm. that. And it's funny because the Bible is full of examples of people like Paul, who he used to write one third of the New oh, Testament. Yeah. He's a murderer and everything. He was a he's about as he bad as you get. A yeah. religious guy who thought he knew what was right and was out murdering Christians in the name of God. And it wasn't God slapped him off his horse one day and said, Why are you pressing me? And God ended up he ended up getting saved and then God used him to write a third of the Bible. The Bible talks about all kinds of people um one of one of the ancestors of Jesus was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. She helped the Isra Israelites because she realized that God was with them, and she wanted that too. Um, King David, who's really famous in the Bible, he he had he had an adulterous affair with and another murder. guy's wife, and then when he was going to get discovered, he sent the guy off into battle, where he knew he would get killed. So he was a murderer, and. Solomon, who the Bible describes as the wisest guy of all, he, uh, the wisest king of all, he ended up doing a lot of really stupid things. He ended up worshiping false gods, which the Bible prohibits. But part of that involves like sacrificing your own babies mm -hmm. in a fire. And all these people are, I don't really know on Solomon, but generally they're, they're held up as examples of people who turn to God and he forgave them. Mm -hmm. And that's available to all of us. And, you know, you, you could say, well, I don't think it's right that God would forgive somebody. Well, he would forgive you. And what we've all done, sin in, in the eyes of God, the Bible does say uh, somewhere about the one who commits the greater sin. But in general, but sin separates us from God, regardless of whether it, it seems like a big sin or a small sin. So anything that, that you've done, it's, you can't really criticize someone who's, who's done something you, you think in your judgment is worse. So I'm just saying all of our sins can be forgiven. God will forgive if you ask and turn to him. The Bible says just to believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Mm -hmm. That's all. There are other things people try to add to it, but in the context of the whole Bible, that's not scriptural. Any of those things they add. Yeah. So, did you have something to add to it? No. <laughs> so, but 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 kind of as a, I don't know if we're wrapping up the show or we're still going, but 
I would say, just getting back to what we originally stated, you should stop listening to all the stuff that worries you and stop sharing things that you don't know are true and stop believing things that you don't know are true. You're acting like it's a drug and that you're addicted trust to. God. What's not. funny is there is there is so much evidence for God. I cannot, I can't believe you have to really be trying to avoid it to not see it. But there's virtually no evidence for most of the things that people are sharing on the internet these days and worrying about. Well, that's what I was, was going to say was when you think that God can't forgive you for your sin, that is Satan deceiving you. He loves doing that. He doesn't want anybody to accept Jesus. So he does everything in his power to convince you with things like that. Oh, you're not good enough. Look what you did. Your sin's the worst. And Satan just whispers that in your ear constantly until you believe it and you're being deceived. And, and if deception you, is. If you start realizing, hmm, maybe that's true. Maybe, maybe I really could have a relationship with God. Maybe I maybe my life would be better. Then the devil kind of will come in and say, But look at her sin. Mm -hmm. Do you think do you think it's right that God would forgive someone like her after what she's done? Look at these people in church. Look how look how mean they are. They didn't say hi to you when you walked into the building. Well, you know what? That might say something about those people in the church. They're sinners, just like we all are. But it doesn't mean that God isn't God. Mm -hmm. But the devil likes to just play these games Whisper like, these oh, look, like it's the Goodyear blimp. Mm -hmm. you know, those of you who are old enough to remember that. But it's just, it's a when you're actually thinking about something that God is leading you towards, the enemy will try to turn you away with those kinds of things. So don't don't be foolish because and don't focus on other people. Yeah, focus on Jesus, yourself. It's like you're in front of the judge because of your sin being so horrible and bad. And Jesus walks into the court and the judge is going to sentence you to a certain punishment. And Jesus steps up and says, no, you punish me, not her or him. I'm taking their place. And it doesn't matter what crime you've committed. Jesus walks into that court and he stands there because you've asked him to help you. And he says, I'm right here. I'm going to do it. Um, yeah. Okay. Everybody post your, um, post your uh, questions, please. Um, okay. Let's, Okay, I see we have a couple of questions. Can you grab some questions real quick? And uh, I, while well, Mike's getting questions, I got a couple of birthday presents that I'm going to open. Man, what a birthday party. <laughs> you know what, though? I Crying mean, through your birthday party, yeah. Um, somebody said, are you able to forgive the person that um, almost killed our child? Yes. You know, I'm not saying it's easy to do these things. But we are commanded to love our enemies. And you know the best way to get back at Satan? Is, is to, to forgive. do just that and to pray for those people. Mm -hmm. And the best thing that could happen is if that person comes to Christ, not necessarily through us, that it would have been worth, what, have been happened, worth it. what happened. Even oh. if, and it was very funny because... After it happened, my child was really upset, but they said, you know what? I'm glad it was me. Because I don't know if the other people that were there were saved. And at least I know if I would have died, I would have been in heaven. Guys, we're not telling you this stuff because we're trying to preach to you. We're telling you this because time is short. And you have got to get right with God. We want you to have some of the peace and comfort and hope that we've got. I mean, how wrong of us not to, not not to, to tell share you. this. And even like... Last night, uh, Kimberly sent me a couple of videos from Alaska Prepper because he'd gotten kicked off of YouTube. And so she sent me some of his videos. And I was watching his videos. And I'm like, well, right there's Revelation. It's all happening. It's just everything's happening in Revelation. 
But even he, um, at one of the end of his videos, he said, you know what? If you're not right with God, you need to be getting right with God. We're all seeing it and we're all feeling it. And we all know that it's going to happen. Could we go another 100 years? Yeah, we could. It's extremely unlikely. I mean, just the technology that's described in the Bible alone with the mark of the beast and the world seeing the two witnesses witnessing um, all over the world with live internet, just the technology alone, we have surpassed, in 10 years, we'll have sur surpassed what the Bible talks about. They've already got plans for a one world government. They've already got plans for one world uh, uh, money. They've already got plans for one world religion. So yes, everything is it's falling like every into place. Every day something new is coming that's proven it what it says. And so we're just here to try and tell you and you know answer your questions to let you know that we are not judging you, but we're just trying to give you the truth and let you know the truth. So, all right, uh, put we, your questions in, in the comments there. I'm going to open one of my presents I got real quick while Mike's, oh my goodness. Oh. <laughs> Who sent me this? Um, who is this from? Does it say? Some, usually it says. Okay, I don't know who it's from, but... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look at this. my goodness. Okay, whoever sent me these guys. <laughs> oh, she will love them forever. <laughs> oh, those. I love the hats. Oh, my. Right. in her nose. I love gnomes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. I don't worship them or anything like that. Mike, maybe you should try this outfit on sometime. She'll really <laughs> fall in love with you all over again. <laughs> <laughs> whoever sent me these, thank you. Yes. Oh, my goodness. They came straight from Amazon, and I don't think it says who it's from on here, but and thank you. I just wanted to thank Nancy for my chocolate. Yeah, well, yes, oh, that was over okay. here that we were going to do. Okay, so do you have um, comments or do you want me to finish up? Well, presents? just one person One person said something along the lines of, uh, what did Jesus mean when he said to be perfect? So that's a reference to uh, Matthew chapter five. Um, I'm going to start back at 43, but it's actually 48. Uh, and he said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And in other places, the Bible tells us that we cannot be perfect without Christ. And in, even, here, in Christ, we are perfected and our sins are not and, remembered. Anymore. And we are not perfected yet to the degree where we won't sin anymore. But we are covered by his perfection yeah. so that if we die, God looks upon us and sees the righteousness of his son. When and, God looks at us, he just sees Jesus is what he sees. And when he brings us to heaven, he will see... Uh, he will perfect us then. But between now and then, he looks at us and sees the righteousness of Christ who has, who has died for us and traded himself for us. Um, the other thing I was going to say is I just happened to look here. Sometimes it's helpful to look. I, there's an app I like called Blue Letter Bible, and it lets you look at the Greek, and it explains some things about the Greek. And uh, the word perfect there is teleos, which... Um, is, is used to mean something that's brought to its end or finished, that's wanting nothing necessary to completeness, that's perfect. Um, and it, it, it's a symbol of kind of being finished, finished. and right where you should be, finished. like you're right. And the idea is that what Jesus is saying here is, if you can get to the place where you pray for those who persecute you and love those who hate you, and stuff like that, that that's, that's what makes you perfect. Um, well, he makes you perfect. But what he's saying is that that is a, a result of the, the relationship that you have with him, that you will start to do those things and want to do those things because he is perfecting you. You'll do more of those things than the sin. 
Right. Because but the sin you will sin. still sin as long as you're alive, because even though he but covers you, you, you don't want to do it anymore. That's yeah. the difference. He puts his spirit in you and you. It would be difficult for a true believer to continue on with a crime spree mm -hmm. because you can do something sinful, but it, he makes it so horribly uncomfortable for you. You would never want to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. So. So as far as the being perfect, there's only perfect, there's no perfection except in Christ. And so that's what he's saying. Look at this. Thank you, Alicia. Can you see? <laughs> they, they, light light they light up. They light up. They light up. Oh, wait, wrong camera. There. It lights up. <laughs> thank so you, Alicia. I, the, maybe the note fell out or something. I don't know, but thank you. <laughs> oh, my cute. goodness. Oh, doodle toot. Um, I have to ask you. Oh, Hold sorry. on just a second. Somebody asked, said that they have, are having a really hard time um, understanding Revelation in the timeline. It is very hard to understand Bible prophecy in Revelation because there's some in Daniel and Ezekiel and Matthew and Timothy and um, Corinthians and Revelation. Bible prophecy is like all over the place and it's kind of pieced together but one of the best preachers that you could watch is david jeremiah i put the link in youtube for you just type in david jeremiah he's the one with the three hundred thousand subs on his uh, youtube channel he would be the best one to help you understand mm -hmm. it um amir safante with behold israel is also another really good one so those two guys if you're wanting to learn more about revelation and how it works in the timeline and that kind of thing. They are the ones. And it does help to listen to somebody like that because they've studied all of this and kind of put it together and they give you the scripture where it's at and that type of thing. And they explain a lot of times the Greek mm -hmm. and different things like that. So Yeah, and if you guys need a Bible, we give free Bibles. If you do not have a Bible and you would like to have one, please go and just ask for it. We have a coupon code for those who can't afford it um, right there in the Bible. And we are still getting donations. Thank, thank you. you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are still getting donations for those. Um, and we really appreciate it. Um, so. Uh, MJ says, I hope you got our box from Michigan. Well, actually, I did. So can you hand me the boxes while you pull questions? And I will open the last couple of bits of my presents here. I was going to reply to Doodletooth. Doodletooth says, um, how do you open a conversation with people you come into contact with to tell them about Jesus, like the grocery store clerk or bank teller? I get so nervous and tongue-tied. I Well, first of all, be nice to them. Yeah. And start smile. Start out with that. Start out yeah. with that, I would say. But kind of what I assumed is not, he has to bring them to a place where they're ready to hear. So I would pray, if you want me to say something, give me an opportunity. And you would be surprised how often that person said, I just wish I knew something, what God wanted me to do in my life. Or I just keep praying because my son is in prison or whatever. And when they say that, if I prayed and said, hey, give me an opportunity. I mean, I recently had someone, I was praying about it. And this person just straight up asked me a Bible question, like directly from the Bible. And I didn't say ahead of time, hey, do you know Jesus or something like that? And, you know, there have been times where I just, I prayed about it. I said, give me an opportunity if you want me to say something. And there didn't seem to be any opportunity. And I, I just think I, I kind of trust God to lead me to that. But you have to listen to him. You have to ask him about it, then they'll listen. Because maybe it's not the time for you to talk to that person. And in a lot of ways, you kind of need to invest in people in real life. I was going like, to say, I, like I don't really through, care about. Yeah, them. I don't go through drive through windows. I walk into the bank and I chit chat with the tailors every time. Oh, you, are but, you going on a trip, you know, or are you getting to go see your granddaughter? I get to learn to know them, whether I'm getting my prescription, you know, from the pharmacy. I go in and make a point of talking and at the at the bank, any place like that. And another thing is that um, a lot of people are successful with is sometimes if somebody's having a really bad day, 
and they say, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like I lost my job. And you, you can just look at them. And this might take a little bit of a per, certain personality, but at, like Mike said, ask God to pray and give you the courage or the ability or the wisdom that you need at that time. And just say, can I pray for you then? Right now, can I pray for you with that? So many people are shocked, you know. Well, what I think what I really find is interesting. Somebody care enough to pray. Even. Well, there's a point where I used to drive down the road and I would see somebody pulled over or stopped or the cars all steaming and everything, and I would just think, I'm just too busy. I'm too busy to stop. No, I can't really stop. stop right now. And there's a point where I finally realized I'm self-employed. I mean, when I wasn't self-employed, I still could have done this, but I thought, okay, Lord, if I should stop, let me know. Well, I realized a lot of times when somebody needs something on the side of the road. That's kind of the clue that they need. <laughs> they maybe it would be good to stop and help them, and so I usually will stop and ask them. But I used to hang out in this one area where I was always in a certain library, at a certain grocery store, a certain McDonald's, like a whole bunch of like certain things right there together. And everywhere I go, everywhere I went, they knew me. I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just got to know the people, and I didn't just come. I didn't come trying to tell them, but. After a while, I was like, hmm, I guess I'll stop and help this person, see if they need help. And sometimes they would say, oh, I'm good. I'm just waiting for a call. Okay. But but then I started asking, like, Lord, if it's if I should say something to this person, give me that opportunity. Let me recognize this from you. And sometimes it would happen and sometimes it didn't. But what I noticed is more, I, it, it was kind of crazy how many times the conversation went in this way where I just suddenly could feel like I was on fire. And I just thought, wow, this is definitely coming from God and not me. And, and I realized that I, we're all so busy that we don't hear his voice. Mm -hmm. But I realized that the more I started doing that and thinking, hey, use me today. And, and I'm going to say right now, I'm not doing that as much as I, as much as I was then. And I, I, would, I need to be trusting more, but um, but I realized the more I was just open to him using me and, and saying, hey, what's, who, am I supposed to say something to this person? And if so, what? The more I realized I could hear his voice all the time saying, go talk to that person. Go talk to that person. And I would go talk to that person and just right away, somebody would say something and I would realize, whoa, this moment was appointed. Mm -hmm. And and so that's what I, I would say is, if you see somebody that looks like they need help, help them. Maybe pray for is this an, is should I say something to them? Is this an opportunity? And if not, okay, you've helped them. Maybe God will use that in the future to give an opportunity in that situation. Yeah, and Michael Michael likes to talk. He enjoys talking to people and stuff. And um, but my dad, he was he was not that type that he would just talk all the time. Just yeah, you know, he just was not quite as talkative, but it was interesting at my at my dad's funeral. It was packed. I couldn't believe how many people came to that funeral and they asked if anybody wanted to say anything. And people started guys, young guys, really young guys, all different ages. But a lot of young guys would pop up and say, you know, my car broke down and I didn't know what I was going to do. And Toby was right there helping me like he had all the time in the world and he would just bend over backwards. He lended me a tire. He lended me these tools. He plowed my driveway. He plowed like my 12 driveway. driveways yeah. every day. Yeah, he plowed <laughs> everybody's driveway. They were naming off one thing after another of what my dad had done and just being there to help them. And there, they, these grown men were sobbing and crying at this funeral. I was just so surprised. And, you know, the pastor that day at the funeral gave an unbelievably good plan of salvation. Now, my dad maybe didn't have it where he could pop up with the plan of salvation to the, each one of those individually, you know, when he came across them like that. But even at his death, God will use things like that that you don't know. You'll think I'm a failure because, you know, I didn't talk and tell everybody about Jesus, everybody that I meant and stuff like that. But he had everybody here in one building, and they all got the plan of salvation. And they were all affected by what my dad had done that you know drew them closer to the Lord. So God uses each individual person in a different way. 
So don't panic if you don't do it like Mike does or like Tara does. She does beautiful on the YouTube channel. I don't know if I could do as good as she does. Each individual person has something. Just pray and ask God, show me what you want me to do. And it may be something totally different, but just do it anyway. And he'll just keep guiding you. But well, now that you your oh. Actually, it's funny because our one of our sons inherited grandpa's Model A, which grandpa told him two years before he was dying. Well, it's time for me to go. So I'm teaching you how to fix this so it can be yours when I'm gone. <laughs> well, our son contacted the Model A, Model T Ford Club and was talking to them about some stuff he was trying to fix on the car. And eventually it came up that he was related to, uh, to great grandpa. And all of a sudden they were all like, oh, he was the greatest guy. Like they knew all this stuff mm -hmm. and they hadn't seen him for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's funny yeah. the impact you have. And a couple of other things I was going to say, partly because of what you said and some other what some other people are asking. One thing about talking to people is um, it's not your job to save people. No. God uh -huh. does that. And the Spirit has to work in their hearts. He does call us to talk to people and to tell them the truth. But... If you tell them something, if you're worried that you're going to say something that sounds foolish or you're just not going to be smart enough to know what to say, he says he will give you the words at the time. And if you walk away from it feeling like kind of an idiot, um, it's it's not up to you. It's up to you to tell them. It's not up to you how they respond. And so ultimately, he's going to reach the people that are willing to come. But the thing is, he asks us as believers to go tell them. And, and if, if not you, he will use someone else. So what I would just say is don't be afraid that you'll say something dumb. But also don't feel like you have to go to everyone and like when they don't really, they're not really interested in their doing some other thing and just at the wrong possible moment say, hey, do you know where you're going to go when you die? Because, or maybe you're supposed to say that to somebody. Maybe you are. If God, you know, but, sometimes you never know. But there are people who feel like it's their own personal responsibility to save somebody. Yeah. And I do have to say, people yeah. said that to me when I wasn't a believer, and it wasn't the right time, probably. But later, looking back, I realized it was a seed in my mind. It did, even though I don't think that that was the best technique. Mm -hmm. In the end, God used it anyway to bring me. So yeah. I always try to look back because I, I wasn't saved till I was 23. So I look back and try to remember what what was I thinking before? How did I feel before? And how did how did people reach me? Well, they didn't really reach me. God reached me. But what kind of things did he use? Mm -hmm. And it's amazing because I, I use those memories when I talk to people. So anyway, go ahead. All right, you pull a couple more questions and we're going to open a couple of presents. First of all, thank you, Rose. I got the beautiful necklace you made me. I appreciate that. I can't wait to try it. Um, and then Nancy. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, Nancy. Thank you, thank I, you. I have to confess, <laughs> I opened it when it came because it's caramel and chocolate. And I'm afraid I already ate some. <laughs> Tara said, no, we need to save these, but thank you. And then I think she got you yeah, got me these too. Yeah, she got really good. So thank, thank you for you. that. I've already indulged. And Julie, thank you for the ideas for the skirting. I appreciate that. And this is from Barb. Thank you, Barb. It's a Wendy's card. Oh, my Ooh. goodness. That oh, is Barbara treat. loves us. So that must Thank be for you, your Barbara. birthday. This one must be for my birthday. Oh, oh, Whoa. look at that beautiful card. That is gorgeous. I know. Look at mine. It's all sparkly oh, with it. the... Oh, cool. Oh, thanks, Oh, Barbara. we got to go to Wendy's together. Oh, <laughs> yum. Now I don't have to cook dinner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are so thoughtful. Okay, you Mike's... These are the best things, too. Mike's pulling questions. Just a second. Okay. I'm guessing this will be okay if you have any questions oh, go ahead and throw them in there thank you the, who oh. is this from i didn't even see who it was from oh because i didn't open the card hold on let me see who this is from let's see that is 
That's oh, and another Ooh, pretty, pretty card. Oh, Terry, thank you. <laughs> oh, oh, pretty the card, card too. Okay, one last one. Just a second. Mike, some other questions. Guys do this on purpose. Like the card matches the same color as the top. I, I think, think they do. Helpful. I do too. They, okay, they do Nancy sent me this huge. Oh, oh my, my goodness. goodness. <laughs> okay, so I cut it open, but I didn't look. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, I good grief! Anything like um? Look at those. Those are nice and <laughs> oh, look at these! <laughs> oh, oh my goodness! Cute. Oh, thank you so much! Oh, oh, oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> look at that one. <laughs> Ian says the Sunshine State of Michigan on the back, and then oops. My favorite seasoning. Oh, Ooh. I love to try that. I like trying new seasonings. What kind is it? Montreal. Oh, yeah. Steak. I'm getting a steak for my birthday, so I'll try it on that. <laughs> I uh, these cards. Um, it's on sale for four ninety seven a pound, and I told Mike that's what I want for my birthday cake. <laughs> I'll read this later. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, guys. <laughs> oh my goodness! Thank you, you guys. Okay, let's set this here, and then we'll finish answering the last couple of questions. Let's see, can you set the box over there? Oh, is it too heavy? You got it? Sure. I'm just going to say, Alicia asked, what about those of us who are shy about sharing the gospel? I love using Facebook to share Jesus, but in person much different. It's probably not that effective on Facebook. Um, I think a lot of people try, but what's more important is just to get out and meet people and love people and care about them and help when you see somebody needs something because and and at the same time i would also say always be praying about what god wants to do with you and he will lead you to those things i had the talking about helping people i had the realtor's wife when i bought my house she was talking to me she said her and her husband weren't saved and when they moved here um they somehow the if they met somebody, I forget where, neighbor or something like that, and they asked them, or somebody at work or something asked them when they were moving into their new house, and they said such and such a time, and she said, well, we'll come and help you move. The church, people the church will come and help you move. She said, oh, no, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. And she said, well, what day and what time? And so she told her, and she said, I didn't think maybe one or two people or if anybody would show up. And do you know the day that they were supposed to move, everybody came, they moved everything in like a, just a couple of hours, had them all moved in, settled in. She said, they just did that because they're wanting to get me saved. She was, you know, she said, I just thought that's, they're just being nice because they want me to start coming to church and get saved. I know what they're doing, but you know what? She went, she said, I couldn't believe it. We went to church and they ended up getting saved and going to that church for years, you know? So you never know. It, cook dinner for someone. Uh, yeah. Bake an bread, elderly bake somebody. Do something, you know, anything like that. If you don't feel comfortable in one area, pray about it. And maybe God will give you a totally different idea than what you originally were thinking you should do. You know, so just be open is what the main thing is to be open and willing. Yeah, and God will do God will show you. A lot of those people that um, eventually God led me to talk to, I had already been just making small talk with them all the time because I actually do that all the time because I just like people. <laughs> and and sometimes that led to opportunities. It's interesting. Frank here says the gospel is simple. Tell your story. That's another thing uh, is if a person, if a person that maybe you don't know that well, but anyway, they share some personal thing of their life with them. If there's something that you've gone through that's similar, share it. And yeah. talk about how God worked in your life. And I was just going to say, for years, I've been saved for years and years, and I just didn't feel real comfortable either, you know, about just going up to somebody. I still don't sometimes. But, yeah, but here it is. Now, look at how many years later, 40 years later, 50 years later, we are doing this on YouTube, and we talk about Jesus all the time to thousands of people on YouTube, you know, and who would have known? I, I would feel so bad. I think, well, I haven't talked to anybody and told them about Jesus. And I just felt guilty about it. If you feel really guilty about stuff, that's Satan. That Satan. <laughs> that's Satan. 
uh, and condemned, that's Satan. Now, conviction is different. When I do something wrong, God quietly tells me, you should be doing this. You know, the Holy Spirit speaks to me. But I felt guilty for a long, long time. I thought, what is wrong with me? Why? I love the Lord so much. He's just so important to me. And it took several years before. And then when I finally did start doing it, it wasn't just like one-on-one. -on -one. It was like women's groups or stuff like that. It was just big. <laughs> but I never expected that. But I felt comfortable more talking to a huge group, you know, and, and that type of thing. That's my personality. God has every one of us with a different personality to do things differently. So please don't lock your in self into what somebody else is doing and what feels comfortable, you know, to somebody else. Grab the ideas. You maybe can use some of their ideas and, and try something. But until you feel really comfortable, you know, just be good to people. Just be kind and thoughtful. Yeah, you, you don't always have to tell them uh, like the first time you see them or you don't have to be looking at them as a project. You can look yeah. at them as a person and treat them as a person. Caring. But I, I'd say in many, many occasions, I've just known somebody after talking to them a lot and they would tell me some problem that was happening in their life and ask me what I think. Well, it's interesting how God has led me to a lot of people had this have are experiencing some of the same things now that he's already led me through mm -hmm. and so it's easy to tell my story and also be sharing now i don't know what he's going to do with that it's i mean sometimes a person is there and they're like what do i do how do i be safe well then you tell them but sometimes they're like well i don't really know what i think about that okay it's between they can go and, and think about it and talk to God. If, Come back to me if they want to know. It's like a harvest. You may not get to harvest the wheat, but you may just plant the seed and somebody else might harvest. Um, there was almost always that's going to happen. Yeah, it's the way it works. So don't get them. disappointed and don't feel sad. It's like the boys were packing up the Bibles the other day when I came by. Is your battery running low? Oh, no, no, you got it. Go ahead. The boys were packing up the Bibles, and I said, do you know someday when you get to heaven, there's going to be somebody that says to you, I got a Bible that you packed for me, and I'm saved and in heaven now because of that. You never know. You never know. So I better stop. Okay. So the, we have a question. My adult daughter has admitted to being a good witch. Now I don't feel comfortable having her in my home, as I know anything not of God and Jesus is of the devil. Is this wrong as a parent? Okay, so you one. have to, first of all, you're just going to have to pray about this a lot. But I would say if she's willing to still have a relationship with you and you're her parent, that I would continue having a relationship with her. Now, I would not allow her to do any sort of mm -hmm. her witchcraft, whether it be good or not, because there's no such thing as a good witch. You're either a witch or you're not. And um, so I would not allow her to practice any of her witchcraft in your home, but I would invite her. I would still have a relationship with her and have her come so that she knows that because here's the thing. Yes, it's from Satan, but her sin is no worse than anybody else's sin. If your child was a thief, would you have them in your house? Yeah, you probably would. And so you are covered by the blood of Jesus. You are protected. Those demons that are um, attacking her will try to pester you. That's why you're going to have to pray, put on your praise music, and read your Bible before you have contact with her or call her or whatever. But I probably would still continue a relationship it's similar to the marriage relationship when they say that you uh if you have an unsaved husband and you accept christ as your savior if they're willing to live with you the unsaved husband they the bible says go ahead and do it because you might lead them to you know your witness might lead them to the lord and the same i think would probably go with the child well same and, type of thing. and there's a certain understanding to say you know what i don't agree with what you do it really goes against what i believe and I still love you greatly, you, but you can't do that in my house. Yeah. And and just say no if you become aware of that kind of thing. But at the same time, like Tara was saying, it's sin is still sin. So 
and, and everyone who sins needs God. Like all of us who are believers have sinned before and still sin some, but we're changed. But I think God leaves us with some sin that we struggle with in general so that we don't get too proud of ourselves mm -hmm. for how awesome we are because we're not awesome. We're beggars just coming for bread, just like everybody else. It's just that we have found the one who's adopted us and who's made us his child. And your children are gonna have to find Christ on their own. Yeah. You know, and unfortunately that's hard to do as a parent, but you just have to have faith that you raise them to believe in Christ, you pray for them, you continue to pray for them. And the Bible says that if you bring them up, you know, so one way I pray too is I say, bring somebody at, from their work, a friend, somebody that they associate with that loves the Lord too, to be an example mm -hmm. and an influence on them. You know, pray that. Uh, by the way, Joanne says, even if you feel rejected when sharing the gospel, the seed has been planted, trust God to take care of it. And that's true. There were some people that I look back and I think I'm not sure I would have approached me the way I did and I didn't respond very well to them. I'm sure they walked away thinking that wasn't a very good idea and there's probably a better way they could have done it. But nevertheless, God still used it. And I think that's another thing is when Jill was talking about how everyone, God brings you into the presence of a lot of people and he has a lot of people interact in your life, planting seeds. But part of the reason why pretty much none of us have the experience of saying, oh, I led a million people to the Lord. <laughs> it's because the Bible is full of things that say, God does not want you to think you're doing it. Yeah. He wants you to know it's him. So like there's a story, uh, I've mentioned it before, but there's a story in the Bible where the Israelites, he's calling the Israelites to go to fight a battle. And he says, nah, you have too many people. So then he says, you know, pick out only these people. And then they got the army down to like 10% of what it was. And he's like, yeah, you still have too many people. And so then he gave him a test for which people to use in the battle. And I think it was like 200 at the end. It was like a really small yeah. army. And, and the reason why God does those things is because he wants to, you to realize you didn't do that. Mm -hmm. I'm God. Yeah. I did that. And so as far as people coming to Jesus and being saved, he doesn't want you to think, Oh, I did look what I did because that's that's evil pride. We're all supposed to be glorifying him and honoring mm -hmm. him and having a relationship with him. So most of the time, I would say most of the time when I've talked to people, I share whatever God seems to put on my heart with them at that time. I have discussions with them. Sometimes I tell them what it means to be saved and how to get there. And most of the time, I'm, I know he's working in their lives, but I'm not the one to like, you know, to have them say, I want to do that right now. Mm -hmm. I want to be saved right now. Uh, but I know that he's done that work. And one thing that helps me is looking back, realizing how many people he did that brought them into my to life and, mm -hmm. and reached me and, mm -hmm. and how it all just kind of came together one day at the moment when I think he really called me to it to recognize that. Yeah. So. And Mary, yes, I think a lot of people will be saved after the rapture comes. The Bible says that they will be. Um, and more than just the 144,000 Jews that are saved, um, there will be a lot of people saved, but the tribulation is to try to win the Jews over. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the tribulation is mostly for the Jews, but there will be Gentiles, the rest of us, who they will remember shows like this and maybe this show will still be on and you're watching this and the world just but you have, fell apart you so. have to be careful because it you does can't say wait. if you're going to reject them now when you get in the middle of the tribulation god's going to bring it like a blindness or a hardness to your heart mm -hmm. just the way he did pharaoh when he moses you know was taking the people out of israel who fought hardened their god is hardening their hearts so it won't be as easy it really won't in many ways thank you tommy alderman for reminding me that it was gideon, gideon. and it yeah, was gideon. 300 yeah it's gideon. thank you tommy i oh, remember sorry the story i thought you said who it was <laughs> i was like yes. who's this thing oh that's tommy yeah <laughs> all right if you guys need a bible we give them for free an easy to read uh, New Living Translation, and it's totally free. If you cannot afford it, just put in the coupon code free Bible and you will get it at livingonadime.com. Just go to the free Bible on the left 
and um, we will give those to you. Oh, never mind. We ship them out now. We ship out more Bibles than we do cookbooks. Mm -hmm. Like we are shipping out like 20 times more Bibles than we are cookbooks <laughs> at the moment. Which is so, great. <laughs> and we have our cookbooks on sale for 50% off right now for my 50th birthday on Friday. Um, so go grab those if you want a copy of our cookbooks. And we also have 10,000 books arriving next week. So we're going to need to make some space, 26 too. 26 pallets. 26 pallets are coming. Last time we so, were beat up the rest yeah. of the day after doing uh, seven pallets. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you want to give your life to Christ, I would not wait. I would do it right yeah. now. It is not hard. All you have to do is know that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins. Confess your sins, repent of them, and ask them to God. Jesus to be Lord of your life, and he will accept you. God will accept you as his child. That's all you have to do. If you have any questions, please email us. We are happy to answer if you have any questions. Visit us. Wait, I would say uh, some people would be sure to mention that um, some places the Bible says repent. And what repent means is recognize that God is right about what he says about you and that you the, the things that you have been believing or doing are wrong and deciding to follow him, deciding to agree with God. That's what repentance means. And before we go, uh, did you want to say something about the books? I was thinking I'd like to pray us out. Uh, Sandra, I would let the church know um, because maybe they got some wires crossed or something. So, okay, Mike, we'll pray and visit us at livingonadime.com. We'll see you guys next time. All right, Father, thank you so much for your unfailing love for us and for all the people that are here. You say it's not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of you and that all that call on your name would be saved. And for all those who've heard your message tonight, we ask that you go with them, bring them to you, but go with them if, if they're unsure and continue ministering to them as you have been up to now. And we thank you for all the amazing blessings that you've given to us. And we thank you for protecting us and our family and for knowing that ultimately our relationship is directly with you and no one else. And we ask that you go forward in the lives of all of the people that are here and show them yourself and bring us all closer to you. And we ask that you just protect us and help us to seek you every day in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye-bye, guys. Thanks a lot, guys. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Uh, oops, I forgot. Okay. Bye. <laughs>